Okay. Uh, Destiny, do we have the amendment for 625? Oh, no, that's Delegate Lewis. Oh, there it is. Yes, 625. There it is. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's already on the agenda. Okay. And he did have he did have an amendment. Yes, ma'am. It removes right. um, any language about grocery stores. Okay, yes, that's the one. Okay, and we are live. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Senator Joanne C. Benson, chair of the Prince George's County uh, Senate delegation. And we wanna thank everybody for coming this afternoon. As you know, we are on a tight schedule. Uh, there's a lot that we need to do this afternoon in the way of uh, getting these bills through. And I wanna say to everybody, uh, we're, going to, we're going to move these bills out of here today. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we can get it done uh, between now and 4.30. And uh, it, for, your, for, for the senators, uh, we did in fact uh, provide for you a synopsis of each of the bills and it will make it easier for the attorney uh, to, to uh, interpret what each bill stands for. Uh, you see that, uh, that uh, the bill- Ed Burgess is on here. The committee wow. that, that the bill is being assigned to, the hearing date, and a brief synopsis. And I'm hoping that each of the senators have uh, this before you so, it'll, so we can get these bills out of here today because we don't have a whole lot of time. We have to, we have to do what needs to be done. And yes, I have to apologize. And uh, I'm just very sorry that the bills are, are kind of late getting over here, but we have to get these bills out of here because we only have a few more days in which uh, to have these bills assigned these bills will be acted on just so everybody will know the process. The bills are going to be acted on and then they are sent to the committees. They are already assigned to committees and the committees will have to act on these bills. Okay, so thank you very much. And with that, we wanna get started uh, on Senate Bill uh, 842 and I will turn it over to the attorney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Crystal Lemieux here. Um, this is a bill that the delegation actually already passed a couple weeks ago. Senate Bill 842 is the work group to study the assessment, treatment, and available resources for female youth in contact with the justice system. Um, the delegation should have before them an amendment for the bill. So that's what's before the delegation today. The amendment just clarifies that the work group and its work is specific to Prince George's County. There was some confusion in the standing committee and they just wanted some clarification on that. Okay, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, this is a bill that was, uh, that was uh, of great concern from our county uh, state's attorney. And so uh, I'm very, very happy about that. So it's now going to be, instead of a statewide bill, as you heard, it is going to be a local bill. What is your pleasure? Move the amendment. Move the bill. Is there a second? Second. second. Well, it's been moved and properly second that uh, we move the bill, yes. Senate Bill 842, yes. to the, uh, and we will be sending a letter to the Judiciary Proceedings Committee to let them know that uh, the bill has been acted on by the, by the senators. Moving right along, House Bill 444, Madam uh, Attorney. This is House Bill 444, Prince George's County Planning Board, Non-Traditional Recreational Opportunities, Establishment and Fund. This bill requires the Prince George's County County Planning Board to include appropriate non-traditional recreational opportunities as part of the recreation programs offered in the county. Non-traditional recreational opportunities is defined to mean sports, recreational activities, programs, or facilities in the county with a reasonable promise of growth in either popularity or participation or demand among youth population that are otherwise underrepresented or underserved by traditional recreational activities. The bill establishes the non-traditional recreation fund to be used to develop and maintain non-traditional recreational opportunities in the county, including being used for certain capital improvement projects, providing access to certain equipment, and for supplies and other direct program costs associated with providing non-traditional recreational opportunities. 
The commission must record revenues from the development and maintenance of non-traditional recre recreation opportunities in the county into the fund. Okay, senators, you've heard the bill. What is your pleasure? House Bill 444, what is your pleasure, Senator? Favorable, favorable. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second. Been moving properly second that we move uh, House Bill 444 to the appropriate committee. Are you ready to vote? All in, in favor? Aye. Right. Are there any opposition? Is there any opposition? Thank you very much. Moving right along, House Bill uh, six, uh, 464, Mandatory referral review, Madam Chair. I'm uh, Madam uh, Attorney, I'm sorry. Sure, yeah, I don't, I don't want that job, but thank you. <laughs> um, so this bill establishes guidelines for a complete submission referral to the commission for specified activities in the Maryland Washington Regional District. Within three business days after receipt of a submission, the commission must notify the submitting entity that the submission is either one, complete and accepted by the commission, or two, is rejected as incomplete. If a submission is rejected, the commission must provide an itemized list of the information required for the submission to be complete. If the commission fails to act within 60 days after receipt of a complete submission, the submission is deemed approved. If a submitting entity submits an amendment to the original rejected referral submission, the commission must notify the submitting entity of the completeness of the amended submission within three business days and act on the amended submission within 60 days after receipt of the amendment. If a submission is rejected as incomplete after an entity has submitted the amendment at least three times, the entity may notify the commission that it is unable to provide additional information on the submission through reasonable means. After receipt of such notice, the commission must either accept the submission as complete or act on the submission within 60 days. Okay. Oh, you heard the reading of the uh, piece of legislation. What is your pleasure? Senators? Is there a motion to, uh, to accept this a piece of legislation to the say You've got to move favorable. Okay, second? Second. It's been moving properly second that we move uh, HBL, HB 464, mandatory referral review. Uh, those who are ready, are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, any opposition? Well, thank you very much. Moving right along, House Bill 501, WSSC, Board of Ethics. Uh, Madam Attorney. This bill requires a respondent in a complaint reviewed by WSSC's Board of Ethics, who is found to have filed a required financial disclosure statement late to pay a fee of $5 for each day the filing is late up to a maximum of $500. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes. Um, who does this cover? That's, so it's anybody that um, has a complaint before WSCC. Let me just skim through here and find it. Madam Chair, I can answer that question, I believe. Guy Andy's from WSSC. Yes. Okay. Uh, Senator, if you're asking who, what employees this covers, this covers all employees under the executive salary schedule grade 12 or above under the general salary schedule or those holding decision-making uh, positions as designated by the general manager. And does it include members of the commission? No, sir. They would, they already fall under the, uh, the state, the state um, gotcha. uh, ethics commission, sir. So about how many people does this cover? Uh, it would cover, I believe we have, it's about two thirds of our employees. No, not two thirds, about a third of our employees that have to file the financial disclosure statements. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sir. Okay, are there any other questions? What is your pleasure? Favorable. Do we move favorable on the bill or what? what favorable. Second. It's been moving properly second that we move this bill out uh, House Bill 501, it goes to Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs. Are you ready to vote? Those who are in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Moving right along. 
House Bill 615, Natural Resources, Sunday Deer Hunting and Archery Hunting Safety Zones. Mm. Move favorable. Move favorable. Right. Is there a second? Favorable with amendments. Yeah. Madam Chair, uh, Madam Attorney. Yeah. Yes. Do you want? Do you want me to provide the, the? Sorry, I I'm sorry. I don't have an amendment. I don't believe for this bill. It was actually the bill. Was, I'm sorry. The bill was amended in the House, so we right. we are conforming to that. Bill. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'd like to speak to it, please. Okay. All right, Senator. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this will take 16 Sundays. Um, like 30 or 40 percent of the Sundays of the year um, and allow hunting from dawn to dusk. And we have a lot of people who are bird watchers, who are horsemen and women, and opening up Sunday hunting basically puts these people in jeopardy. You know, I mean, these bullets don't stop, um, you know, where the, where the hunter uh, tries to kill the animal. And I think it's very dangerous. And I think there are enough days for hunting. Um, and if there are too many deer, the uh, DNR is allowed to do targeted shooting to reduce the deer population. Uh, personally, I think it's a bad idea. There are a number of other jurisdictions that are trying to do this. And there's been a big uproar. I mean, I, you know, I want hunters to be able to hunt but I also think there are people who should be allowed to go into the woods and forests and do other uh, nature things without being uh, afraid of getting shot by, uh, by a bullet. So uh, I'm gonna vote no on this and I think we should uh, hold this for another day. Okay. So, uh, let, me, so, let me explain the amendments, please. Can I, can I explain the bill? Yeah. So the, the amendments this that have been- uh, Is this your bill, Senator? Yes, this ma'am. your bill, okay. Yes, ma so, so we, we receive uh, extensive uh, uh, opposition and support for the bill and the opposition, the amendments have actually addressed the concerns. Uh, this hunting would be allowed only on private property with the permission of the private uh, owners of those uh, properties. Uh, I live right in the middle of, uh, you know, um, the woods and, um, and I also, you know, in addition to the ability to hunt, I mean, it's also, uh, you know, DNR has always had the ability to come in to eradicate the deer growth and yet it's still not enough. Um, you know, we have the population of, uh, which causes for us in the Southern part of the county and other parts of the county, uh, you know, multiple accidents, there's carcasses on the road, uh, but I think that uh, the amendments address those uh, concerns. Okay, let's go back. Uh, the amendment now says it only can occur on private property. On private property with permission from the owners. So, where, where is that amendment in the uh, bill? That was done in the house. That they, I understand. The house I have the bill in front of me. Uh, could you tell me where that is? Madam Attorney, do you have the updated? Uh, Sure, yeah, so everybody should have the three, um, three, third reader version. So Senator Pinsky, if you look on page five of the bill. Yeah. You'll see down in line 27 that Prince George's County has been struck through, removed from that, um, that provision. So that's the provision that allows hunting on public land if it's designated by DNR. So originally, okay. It, it, okay. Is there language that says that the bullet must must stop at the end of private property and not continue in the public property? Obviously, I'm being facetious. Um, but one of the problems, uh, Madam Chairman, is, you know, bullets go for hundreds of yards and I can be hunting on private property. It doesn't mean they're not going to hit um, people walking in the woods, children, or people on a horse. So I still, while I appreciate the amendment, uh, I'm going to be voting no on this. But I, um, Madam, Madam Chair, I move favorable on the bill. Madam Chair, uh, this is yes. uh, Jim Rosenbaum. I, I got a couple of questions. Have, did we get a second? Oh, I'm sorry. Second. Okay. Okay, now for discussion, uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Senator Rosenbaum, you were speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. I'm, I'm not an expert on hunting and I'm not an expert on these laws. So as amended, this would allow hunting for 16 additional days a year on private property with the permission of the landowner. Is that the essence of it? Yes. And that's anywhere in Prince George County? Yeah. Yes. And I'm, I'm only raising this semi facetiously. Uh, you know, I see a lot of deer in my neighborhood in College Park. I literally. Well, well. Yes. Well, could, could I just finish? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, 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 this may be a stupid question, but I want to put it in context because it, it, so I literally had a deer walk down my driveway last year. And so I, I know there are a lot of deer around. But would this essentially allow 16 days a year? Is, is I could authorize shooting deer on my property, my little suburban backyard. I mean, how, how does this really work? I don't get it. No, no sir. Uh, you, you know, in order to have hunting on your property, I mean, there's a there are procedures that the Department of Natural Resources puts in tax. So you may, just because you own a farm, I live on a farm, but mm -hmm. I don't have enough space. And trust me, I have 13 deer that are in my yard all day, every day, uh, eating up my shrubs and everything else. But right. I have the ability to go outside and shoot those deer because I live in a residential district. So there are restrictions on when and where you can, you can hunt. Just like this doesn't... This doesn't include that. It only opens up to Sunday. So, those so does, does the property have to get permission of, of DNR? Mm -hmm. Yes. No. No. Yeah, there, there, are, there are farms that are in uh, Prince George County that are, are uh, designated as hunting. Again, you can't have, uh, you can't hunt in a residential area. Just because you have a farm doesn't mean you can hunt. So. But even if you're on a larger property out in the woods, as you say, you don't have to get. Are we going to have to get permission from somebody, or is it automatic under this bill? Madam Attorney, uh, so yeah, so Madam I'm Senator. yeah I'm I'm not sure. I would need to do more research to look into. It. I'm not sure the semantics of how it works on DNR's end. I think that anywhere, and I, I guess the attorney would have to, to verify. But I think anywhere you do hunting, their natural resources has to authorize that. I think you just can't just go out in the woods and start hunting. Paul, do you have a different? Do you agree with that, or have a different point of view? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I do know. I, I believe the owner of the property could hunt. And if he, if he or she sees deer, I don't think they need uh, the license for this. But it's to allow other people. I don't know if DNR has a voice in it. If it's in an agricultural area, I just don't have the answer. Yeah, and it's already. And, and in addition to that, uh, there is already on the book that you can't, you know, fire a weapon within. Uh, yeah. a certain distance from, um, you know, residents as well. So uh, this doesn't change any guidelines. The only thing that changes here uh, is that you'll be allowed to do it on Sunday. So. Chair. Is there further discussion? Madam yes. Chair. Madam Chair. Yes. Yes. I apologize, Senator Augustine. I, I also, I just would ask if we could just look at this a little bit more closely. I also have some greatness. I've heard from folks who've expressed some concerns about this. And I just, you know, there, uh, there is some unreadiness with it. So I just wanted to make sure to share that with folks before we vote on it. Because in the current posture, in my understanding of it, I don't think I'm gonna be able to support it just based on what folks have shared with me. But maybe with more information, you might be able to get to a comfort level. So, Yes. Madam, Madam Chair? Hello? Yes. Senator Patterson here. Um, let me just weigh in um, uh, a bit here. Um, you know, I live down near the woods also down in, in Fort Washington. And, um, you know, um, uh, some afternoon I come in my driveway and I got eight or nine uh, deer in, in my driveway. I guess. I'm torn about this 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 bill because um, I, I I don't quite understand. You know, I could be adjacent to 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 a land two or three acres of land I hear that's owned by a private owner. Uh, you know, how do I how do I know I'm going to be protected? <clears throat> ma ma Madam Chair, we can hold the bill. I can uh, work with the colleagues over the next day or so to see what we can get done. I mean, obviously. Okay, I, I, let's hold this bill then. Thank okay. you, that's very we'll kind. Hold it. <laughs>
Okay, with you, Mr. Senator, we will definitely hold this bill. Moving right along, then we will move on to House Bill 619, Prince George's County Speed Monitoring Systems, Residential Districts. Uh, Madam Attorney. The bill authorizes the governing body of Prince George's County after reasonable notice and a public hearing to place a speed monitoring system on highways in residential districts with a maximum posted speed limit of 35 miles per hour. Move favorable. Second. Let me just be, okay, we're moving properly second, but let me ask the question. Uh, could you say that again? The maximum speed would be 35 miles an hour? Correct. On state highways or are you talking about county highways? In, in residential areas. So highways, the roads that are in residential neighborhoods. Residential neighborhoods, all right. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, are we ready? Oh, we've got- uh, Madam Chairman, uh, I've got a question. Um, has anybody mapped what percentage of the county will now have be eligible for speed cameras? Are we talking 20% or 75%? I mean, right now they have to be near schools or a higher education institution. Um, this is a, a pretty broad expansion. And I just don't know how much of a county this will now encompass. And, and I wanna be sure that we're not doing it for the, we're doing it for safety and not for revenue. Um, so has anybody mapped out the implications of this? Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Madam Chair, I think uh, while I have not mapped out the ramifications for this, I know uh, I placed a bill while in the house a couple of years ago um, and um, for Croom Road, which is a state road, which has zero shoulder. Um, and we put in this uh, bill, and I believe there were multiple bills that came through, hence Delegate Harrison's um, um, suggestion to uh, put it back, have the county weigh um, the information. So I think uh, I, I don't. I, I can't answer Senator Penske's uh, question, but I will say that um, you know there are some areas of the county that have uh, some speeding challenges, um, particularly for those of us in the south, where the folks coming from the southern counties are coming through and darting through these back roads, and where there are no shoulders on the road, there are school, there are bus uh, stops, there, um, you know, uh, the visibility is minimal, um, and the speed limit is 35 or less. So. Madam, uh, Madam Attorney, this is, uh, and also Senator, this is talking about speed monitoring systems. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a speed camera. That's, that's what they are. It's, it's the term that we use, but it's a, spe it's a speed camera. It's a speed camera. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair? I have a question. Yes. Who are you? Is that me or Senator Patterson? You call You're me? ready. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I just want I wanted to ask the council, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to ask the council, do you have, can you share with me any opposition that came up at the hearing and how the vote went in the, the House side? I, I don't know. I can, I can look into it um, and let you know, but I'm not sure what happened on the, on the House side. Yeah, because I share Senator Penske's concern um, of, um, I know that we have monitoring stations and I believe certain municipalities and certain parts of the county but it sounds like this is a complete like opening up of the entire county to these. And I would, I heard my colleague from Southern Maryland and, and certainly have no issue with targeting problem areas, but I guess I would be concerned if there's just random distribution all over the county. Yeah, and, and following up, following up uh, Senator Griffith, I mean, who's gonna decide? It, and yeah. what happens in a municipality? Does the municipality decide or does the county decide? Mm -hmm. And what role do the civic associations? I mean, you know, they want to protect their kids, but they also drive in those neighborhoods. And I'm not sure they're going to want to be paying uh, too many speeding tickets. So I, I, I have a number of questions. Um, do we, Look, where there's danger, Senator uh, Jackson, I don't want there to be danger. And I want to use whatever mechanism we can down this, to slow cars down protect people. 
this is this is pretty wide open. Does any county in the state have anything this broad? Well, I think I, I'll, I'll say this: that um, you know, two ten was the first state highway in the state that we all voted for because of the uh, the challenges down there. And uh, as we've seen um, concerns uh, from other members, I think this is why the bills have been combined. Uh, look, we don't have enough presence of state police on state roads. Prince George's County has a lot of state roads that state police never visit. And it's not up to the county police or the sheriffs to patrol those roads. So folks are driving, you know, they're pretty much doing anything they want to do. Uh, uh, I can only speak for um, that particular bill that I put in. Uh, right, but these are not state roads. These are, yes, these are county neighborhood roads. These are... These, this is every neighbor, every two neighborhood tenths. in the county. It's a residential district. It's residential. It has nothing to do with the state highway. Neighbor. Well, I, mean, well, I live in the country, so there are residential down there, but I got you. I, ju I just... Um, because state highway has already told us they, they're very clear about, uh, about speed cameras. They're very clear. Uh, it absolutely has to be near a school that's open. Uh, we're having, we're, as a matter of fact, we're having an issue in our district right now about our speed cameras that are in a a school district where the school hasn't been open for two years and they're trying to determine whether or not the three cameras should stay there or should they be be closed down until the school opens so you know i understand exactly what you're talking about uh but we're in these uh, madam chair yes yeah. could someone talk uh, uh explain to me about the proceeds how is the split who gets the money how are the money used that's being collected from these three cameras Madam Chair, I have a, a little bit of information on that that I can share. Um, yeah, I would the, like for you to do that. Sure. The relevant jurisdiction um, gets to recover the costs of implementing the system and then can spend any remaining balance solely for public safety purposes, including for pedestrian safety programs. Um, if the balance of the revenues after cost recovery for any fiscal year is greater than 10% of the jurisdiction's total revenues, the excess has to be remitted to the comptroller. Okay, that's the new bill. Well, let me speak about 210, okay? Because I, I just got off 210 and I, I was gonna try and make it to Annapolis and the traffic so bad I had to turn around and come back to my house. Um, I'm not sure even though we got speed cameras on 210 that we've seen a significant decrease in, in speeders. I, I'm not so sure it's more of a behavior problem than uh, uh, directly, uh, uh, speeding. Carlotta. I, I would, um, I don't know. I, I think, I hate to see us just open up a floodgate of putting meeting with the cameras. Everyone. What I other counties are doing? Are they falling in the same line work of uh, putting speed cameras on? I still think it's not it related to revenue. <laughs> Madam Chair, Jim Rosenpeth. Um, I just want to jump in on this in a couple of different ways. One is my understanding and impression in the deep recesses of my memory is that Montgomery has a considerably broader uh, authorization for this than Prince George's does. They were the first county to go into speed cameras in a significant way. And it's broader. I don't know exactly what it is. That's point number one. <clears throat> point number two is my experience is speed cameras work. They work in two ways. One is they actually reduce speeding. That's why the city of College Park, the University of Maryland, we fought. To, to expand the old law, which did not cover universities, to cover universities, <laughs> to be sure that we could do this on Route 1 in College Park. Uh, we've seen it work throughout my district. We definitely have areas of my district, residential areas, where I mean, literally, I would say in the past two months, we've had two different communities with exactly this issue. And they're, because they can't have speed cameras in these areas, uh, they're begging for police. And that goes to Senator Jackson's point, which I totally agree with is we want police doing things only police can do. We don't want police doing things that cameras can do. Uh, it just, to me, it just doesn't make any sense not to be more forward leaning on the use of cameras. Now, on the money question, uh, I agree that we don't want people putting in speed cameras just for the money, but we can fix that by saying where the money goes. So my suggestion, given that there seem to be a lot of divergent views on this and some lack of information would be, would be to hold this and talk a little bit offline to see if we can both get the information we need and kind of get in a place that people are comfortable with. 
Let me just add to that, Senator, Senator Roosevelt. You know, I appreciate you talking about what College Park, but I've lived out here for 40 years in Dutchess mm. County. I know what happens out on 210. And uh, I can. Oh, I believe you. I okay. totally believe All right. You. Okay. Totally All right. Just, it's different in my okay. area. In, in, Leslie. I'm just raising hands and everybody else blurting, by the way. But. <laughs> Go ahead, Senator. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I did just want to follow up and say I absolutely get the need. I walk through my neighborhood. I get the concern about safety in residential communities. I get that. Um, and again, follow up on uh, Senator Penske's earlier concern. That is, if we're going from 10% of our residential roads to potentially all of them, what the process is, how we manage it, sort of just a better understanding of the uh, implementation plans and process. I understand the concern was raised in a part of the county. I know that our municipalities have them. I know we have them in certain zones, but I, I just wanted to get some clarification about the implementation plans and process. Otherwise I get being safe, people are walking more, let's keep our neighborhoods safe, but let's know that there's a process for implementation, not going from this to this overnight. Got you, madam. Okay, what do you all want to do? You want to, Do you want to hold Oh, am I muted? May I say one thing before you decide whether you're going to hold it or not? <laughs> uh, so folks are walking, biking, and just driving, and folks are being, you know, uh, put in danger. But also, by taking this back to the county, the county then makes a decision where to put them. The county doesn't just arbitrarily just put them anywhere. Uh, that goes with extent from, and those placements would be from extensive studies. Uh, the last time we had uh, enforcement on one of those back state roads, uh, we took uh, sheriff and county police to send them out there for a few days and they wrote a bunch of tickets. And once that was over, uh, that was fine. Folks realized they weren't out there anymore. So, you know. Okay. What, what, what is your pleasure? Do you all, did we get a motion on this? On Can I get an answer from council? Council is this enabling legislation that will go back to the council. Correct. It's, it's authorizing and enables them to do this. Okay. Okay. Do you all hear me? Yes. Okay. What is your pleasure? Do you want, to, do, we, do we want to move on this bill or do you want to hold it? Or what do you want? What's your pleasure? Madam Chair, I would move we hold it. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moving to properly second. Uh, we, uh, we, we're going to do a roll call on this one. Um, Okay. Uh, uh, Destiny, are you, are you All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Senator Augustine? Yes. Senator Griffith? Madam Chair, we're doing a roll call on whether or not to hold the bill for more information. No, we're getting, doing a roll call to accept the bill. No. 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 We already said we were going to hold motion, it. The motion was to yeah, hold. That's hold. Why, I was like, why are we doing oh, the a bill? The motion is to hold? Okay. Yes. That was my motion. Yeah. Okay. Motions to hold, uh, Destiny. Okay. So I'll start over. Senator Augustine. Well, I, I think that what Senator Griffith said is we don't typically vote on a hold. We're going to get the information and come back. Yeah, Madam Chair, if we're going to get the information in a day or Let's you just know, hold and move on. I don't know why we would. We wouldn't vote. Okay. Why don't you do this? Why don't we hold the bill and let's move on, please. Hold the bill, move on. Okay, House Bill uh, 625. Okay, now listen, let me tell you all something. We've got two bills here we're holding. Now, we're gonna get back to you in the next couple of days because we're gonna get these bills out of here. That's what we're going to do. House uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, you know, we wanna discuss them but just because they moved out of the house doesn't mean they deserve our support. I mean, we're allowed to kill bills or sit on bills. I mean, that's right. If the, that, so I, 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 I just want us to be clear, moving them, maybe may move them off the table, but it doesn't mean if, if a majority of the people think it's not good public policy and we don't want to move it forward, you know, as the Senate of Maryland and the Prince George senators, we have that right. And with all due respect to the house members, Maybe they got the policy wrong. I got that. And but okay. but when I say move the bill, it's either up or down. Okay. Can, I can get it off the chairman's plate. And <laughs> okay. Plate. Understood. With me? 
Okay. Yes, absolutely. All right. Moving right along, the next one is House Bill 625, Alcohol Beverage and Alcohol Density Zone Licenses. Uh, Madam uh, Attorney? This bill authorizes the Prince George's County Board of License Commissioners to approve the transfer of a Class A beer, wine, and liquor license into the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, ah. or 47th alcoholic beverages district in the county if the original license premises is located in an alcohol density zone. The bill defines the alcohol density zone as a census tract having an average of three or more licensed premises with a class A beer, wine, and liquor license per square mile. Move unfavorable. Second. Yeah, let me speak to Madam Chair. Okay, hold a minute. Did we get a second? Yes. Okay. Madam, Madam Chair, on, on the books now, each senator in years gone by decided if they wanted to cap the number of licenses in their legislative district. And over the course of time, at that point, all the uh, senators wanted to put a, a limit on the number of licenses. So if someone wanted a license, they had to wait till one was on the shelf and someone left or they bought one. Um, this bill totally obviates that. It, it takes out the previous action and it says, you know, where we have now have the authority to decide if we want more licenses or not, this bill just knocks that aside. And if, if Madam Chair, if, if you want more or you want less, that would be your call. I mean, I was the first one, I think, to do this many years ago, uh, saying we had too many licenses and I wanted to cap them. And then over the years, Senator Miller, Senator Rosenpep and others, said, you know what, I want to cap them too. As I read this bill, that limitation that was left to each legislative district would be removed. So I'm still trying to figure out why this bill is before us. Senator, can I speak to that, uh, Madam yes. Chair? Yes. The, the, the purpose of the amended bill um, was actually that was to try to relieve uh, some of the alcohol density, particularly in my district, um, in Senator, uh, in, the, in the chair's district, where we have uh, a number of these licenses and the thought process, and you can disagree with it or not, was that through this, it would allow um, for some of those licenses, um, if, if, if it made sense, to be able to transverse from one district to the other and that we knew that. That now that, that was not the case to um, reduce some of the density. Can't hear you. City You're where we were, so only in those places that are dense, aren't dense, that no longer, that, that are, we have new developments out there in the county um, that don't have, uh, uh, liquor stores or or anything else like that and that this would allow for them for us to have a more even distribution of liquor uh, of liquor stores throughout the county that was the purpose that of, of the amended uh, of the amended bill and i'm supportive of that and i'm sure yes um i i'd move to hold this bill uh, I, I remember that there was a uh, it was a work group that was uh, put together uh, regarding this uh, matter when I was in the house, and I'm not sure if that ever got resolved. I think this looks like the original uh, bill that was trying to pass when uh, when it was sent to a work group. So I, I'm not interested. That, in Delegate Lewis is what? actually hopping on right now. Oh. The amended the amended bill strips all the language out, and all that it says is that a a a, uh, a license that is in one of the you know one of these alcohol density zones. It, you know, that it is authorized, that it can move, that it can actually move out of the given legislative district it, it, it versus now, which it cannot. And that's all that's left. Like everything else was taken out of this bill. Okay. Did it go back to the council, back to the full delegation? Well, I mean, we can, we can admit, I mean, we can, ch I mean, I'm telling you what the bill says now, and I understand the unburdened. Yeah, uh, Senator Benson, can I ask Senator Augustine a question? 
readiness, but that's what the bill says right now. Is there anything else like that? It just would allow for those that are in these dense zones, which again, at least I know I have them where we've got liquor stores on top of liquor stores. The hope being that if it made economic sense, they may go out to similar to what happened at Woodmore, um, where you have uh, a, a, a liquor store that is appropriate for that area, for that development, so that we would move some of these licenses with, or, or allow for some of these businesses that are that cannot move to be able to move. And that's it. And, and if I could just jump right in uh, and speak for the 24th Legislative District, we are inundated with liquor stores. We have a liquor store almost in every corner. And it has created real problems, particularly as it pertains to the um, the health enterprise zones and the food desert. I mean, you can you, if you go into the food desert that we are concerned about, there are one. There, I mean, every few steps there is a liquor store, and we are just really concerned about the. And if you look at the number of liquor stores in the 47th district, the 24th district, uh, you will see why there is grave concern and. What uh, the delegate, uh, what Senator Augustine has indicated is that we want to give those people who have those liquor licenses in our district an opportunity to move. Right now, they cannot because of the way that the, the law has been put on the books. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're concerned about. We're very concerned about the fact that we are inundated inside the Beltway with all of these liquor stores, and we need to do something about it. Madam Chair. Jim Rosepep? Yes. Um, I'm totally sympathetic to what you're saying, and I'm totally sympathetic to Senator Augustine saying. Some of you may re recall my, my lonely crusade on the floor a week or two ago <laughs> about um, the bill that uh, kept uh, delivery uh, and offsite for, uh, for restaurants. I, that was part of my concern that, that intensifies that problem. So I'm totally on board with you all. My concern is the way we do it. And that's why I think holding this and looking at it, I wanna work with you on that. I totally agree with that, but I, I'm not sure this way, moving it someplace else where it may cause another problem, I'm not sure is the answer, but I'm, so I'd suggest holding it. Yeah, and Harris, what's the position of the county executive? What's your question? I was asking Ms. Harris, what was the position or the county executive on this legislation. I know we 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 are independent, but I'll be curious to know what's the county executive position. We originally um, supported fully the idea of making grocery stores available to have liquor licenses. When the bill was stripped down to just the alcohol density part of it, we were in favor of that as well, but more strongly about the grocery stores. No, uh, if I may. Oh, sorry, uh, I'll wait till you finish, Senator Patterson. Uh, Madam Chair, just very briefly following up on Senator Rosapep, I agree if, he, if the 24th or 47th wants to reduce the number of licenses. But I got to tell you, I don't want any more in my district. And if six people don't want any more in their districts, but we pass this bill, then it means they can go elsewhere. And it, then it becomes someone else's problem. So. I think you should have the authority and right to reduce the number of licenses, even if the county has got to buy them up. But, but the fact of passing this bill says it's fair game to go into 21, uh, 26, uh, 20, you know, wherever, 25. And I'm not sure that's what we want to do. I mean, we set out a policy years ago to say, look, we know what's best in our district. I thought I had too many and uh, I, I capped it and everyone else agreed there were so. It's a problem, Senator Augustine, Senator Benson. I'm just not sure this is the uh, solution. So, so I, I just want to. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will ask. I will ask that we, like Senator Rosa, have suggested. Can we hold this and I work? We'll work together um, to see if we can't come up with something. Um, Great. Instead of voting on this right now. Great. Yeah. Well, is I that see okay? that delegate uh, Jeff Lewis. Let's is move on, Senator. It, the senator called for a hold. I think we should just move on. Well, uh, not before we hear from uh, Delegate Lewis. Okay, Delegate Lewis. Madam Chair, I, I, I'm fine with the hold. I just wanted to, to add factually that, um, you know, uh, Senator Penske, your district has just as many alcohol density zones. And if you were 
if you are all able to refer to the materials we sent over to you, and I'll follow up with you offline and Senator Rosa Pep offline, while it's an issue that disproportionately affects the 24th and the 47th, it's not exclusive to us. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you guys offline, but thank I you. hear your concern. All right, thank you very much. We'll hold this bill and move on. Thank you very much. House Bill 626, Vehicle Right Monitoring System, uh, Delegate uh, uh, Madam uh, Attorney. The bill Absolutely. authorizes sure. The bill authorizes Prince George's County to use a vehicle height monitoring system to record images of vehicles traveling in the county if authorized by the Prince George's County Council after notice in a public hearing. I have a lot more detail I can provide, but in the interest of time, I'll leave it there. And if you have questions, I can answer them. Okay. Uh, you all have heard this uh, explan ex explanation. What's your pleasure? Hmm. I'll move favorable just to get the ball rolling. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, those of uh, uh, you've heard, uh, is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. moving right along. How do you feel? Those opposed? 789, video screening and archi <laughs> archiving meetings and late payment charges. House Bill 789, Madam uh, Attorney. Can you read that? Crystal, you're muted. Thank you. I just flashed up. Um, can we just pause for one minute? I want to make sure that we voted favorable on the last bill. Kind of, I, heard the, I heard the motion and. We did. Okay. Voted favorable on 626. Yeah. Okay. How's the, thank you. House Bill 789. Uh, is the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission video and audio streaming and archiving meetings and finan financial assistance. This bill requires WSSC to stream live video or live teleconference audio or other audio if it, of its open meetings and to maintain on its website a complete and unedited archived recording of each open meeting. The inability of WSSC to comply with recording requirements due to technical failure that the that entirely prevents or affects the quality of the live or audio streaming of a meeting does not affect the validity of any action taken by WSSC during the meeting if one, WSSC otherwise complies with its other meeting requirements in the Open Meetings Act, and two, the inability to comply is not due to willful action by WSSC. If WSSC is unable to comply with the live streaming requirements of the bill, WSSC must instead make good faith efforts to record its open meetings by video or audio and maintain on its website a complete and unedited archived recording of the meeting. The bill also specifies that financial assistance provided as part of the customer assistance program can include the reduction or waiver of fees, including late fees. Okay. Favorable. What's your pleasure? Move favorable. Second. second. Is there a second? second. Move the second. second that we uh, that we move uh, House Bill uh, seven eighty nine. Are you ready for the question? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposing? Okay. No op opposition. Moving right along. House Bill nine seventy four, Prince George's County Alcohol Beverage Sunday Off Sale Permits. Uh, Madam uh, Attorney. The bill authorizes the Prince George's County Board of License Commissioners to issue a Sunday off-sale permit to any Class A or Class B license holder with an off-sale privilege rather than to a holder of a Class A beer, wine, and liquor license or Class B beer, wine, and liquor license. The bill alters the reinvestment requirement for an application for a Sunday off-sale permit requiring the applicant spend a minimum of $50,000 to rehabilitate and renovate the interior or exterior of the licensed premises within one year after the permit is issued. The bill also repeals the authorization for the board to waive the reinvestment re requirement and requires the board to waive the spending requirement or other holder, oh, sorry, for the holder of certain class B beer, wine, and liquor licenses if the holder can show through receipts that the minimum amount was spent during a certain time period the board is required to revoke the permit and impose a fine on the permit holder not exceeding $5,000 if the spending requirements are not met. The board is also required to adopt regulations to implement the spending requirements. The bill also requires the board to revoke a license if a license holder or a stockholder of the corporation that uses the license is convicted of a felony 
that is related to operations under the license. In the case of a conviction, the board may not approve a license renewal until at least 10 years have lapsed after the date of the felony conviction. In addition to any administrative penalty that may apply a license holder or an employee of a license holder who violates provisions of law regarding selling, providing, furnishing, or allowing the consumption of alcohol by underage individuals is guilty of a misdemeanor and on conviction is subject to imprisonment of up to four years or a fine of $2,000 or both. Lastly, the bill requires the board to conduct a study of Sunday off sale permits to determine how many permit holders failed to make the required reinvestments and how many times the reinvestment requirement was waived. The board must submit the report and its findings to the Prince George's County Executive, Prince George's County House Delegation um, on or before January 3rd, 2023. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Senator Roosevelt. Get, Thank you. First, can I, I, let, let's sorry. do this. Do we have a motion or, on this bill, House Bill 974? Do we have, do we have a motion? No. Do we have a motion for favorable or unfavorable? I don't know enough, Madam Chair. That's why I want to ask some questions. Okay. All right, then with that, we'll have you to ask your question. Thank you. My two questions are, what is the purpose of the bill and how many people will it affect? Madam Attorney? So I'm, I'm not sure how many people it will affect. I would either need to do some research or get in touch with the sponsor of the bill to find out more of that information. Um, and it's essentially allowing for these for the Board of License Commissioners to issue these off-sale permits to any Class A or Class B license holder. And currently it's for um, just for Class A beer, wine, and liquor licenses or Class B beer, wine, and liquor licenses. Oh, no, I, I, I heard that, but I just have no idea what the purpose of it is or who it reaches. I mean, I may not, from my point, I'd be happy yeah. to, but somebody can explain all that. <laughs> Senator, Senator, it basically opens up Sunday sales to every A and B, if they follow, if they fill, fit this criteria, that right now it's limited to 102, 105, whatever. If people spend fifty thousand bucks or have spent fifty thousand bucks on their property, uh, it could open it up to who knows, five hundred, a thousand. I don't know how many. I mean, that's what it does essentially. Okay, Ma Madam is Chair, that, uh, is that correct, or Madam Attorney? That's my understanding. Yes. That's what my understanding is. Okay, what is your pleasure? Madam Chair? Yes. So just to understand, um, some years ago, the, gen uh, the General Assembly expanded Sunday sales to a limited number of stores. This isn't changing the type of license a person has. It's just increasing the number of people that can sell on Sundays if they choose to and if they follow certain provisions. Right. So we're allowing a business that's licensed in our county to operate on another day if they should choose to and 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 meet the qualifications of the board of license commission. Well, now you have to let's go back. Uh, those licenses for Sunday sales was issued only to a certain number. Right, right which I never quite understood because to me, if I'm sell, if I have a Rite Aid or a CVS, I get to open the days that I want to open. Similarly, if I have a Chick Fil A. And I don't want to open on Sunday. I don't have to. But if I have another store, I could. I've never understood why we wanted to limit if everybody has a license and has gone through the process of getting the approval and being vetted and all of that. I don't have an issue with a business operating seven days a week versus six if they choose to and don't know why we pick winners and losers in that conversation. If they're already selling it, and I want to get something on game day or somebody wants to get something for a gathering. So that's just me. Madam, Madam Chair, um, and Madam Attorney, uh, could you once again talk to us? Am I oversimplifying it? I'm sorry? I was asking if I was oversimplifying what the bill does. No, 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 no. I, I think you might, you're on target. Uh, Madam Attorney, the difference between, let's be sure that we understand what the difference is between What's, what's in place now and what the bill is calling for. Sure. Again, it did, it, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's okay. Right, so right now you can have the Sunday off sale permits for any class A beer, wine and liquor license or class B beer, wine and liquor license. 
this, as you had said, broadens it, right? So it's the holder of any class A license or any class B license. It's not specific to beer, wine, and liquor. What else is there? Madam Chair, if I might just responding to Senator Griffith, I mean, I see this as again a public health issue. We just had a debate on the other bill about trying to reduce the intensification of liquor accessibility in places where we got too much liquor being sold. And this just seems to go in exactly the opposite direction. Um, and th I mean, that's the argument on the other side, it's the public health argument uh, that, that we don't want additional concentration of, of liquor because of the public health issues. So that you may disagree, but that's, that's to me always been the reason to cap. That's the reason for all our restrictions. But uh, this, I'm sorry, if I could, this, please, this please. isn't changing the number of stores that sell liquor. It's not increasing density. It's saying to a business owner, that currently can't operate one day a week, you can now operate on Sundays. Right, Where it increases the density of availability. Yeah. I'm sorry, pardon me. And, and so, yeah, my understanding was we held the other bill, not abandoned it, we, but right. I misunderstood that as well. Okay. No, I, I just mean that it increases the density of access to alcohol. It adds an on Sundays. Basically. On Sundays, yeah. But, but it, to me, it's the same thing, but I, I get the argument. No, yeah, because it's already there, I guess. So if I buy it Saturday night at 10 or 11, or I, I buy it Sunday for the football game or the basketball game. Any on other? Sunday, Go ahead, sorry. You know. so. All you right. Know, to this bill? Okay, is there any other discussion on this bill? Madam no. Chair? Yes. I just would, I, I would just want to reiterate what Senator Rosapov just said about actually access and the public health aspects of that um, access to alcohol uh, it, it, it definitely there's a direct correlation with that um, and you know further into uh, substance abuse and you know public health definitely suggests that we limit access as much as possible so I just want to reiterate that okay what's your pleasure with this bill House Bill Madam, 974 Madam Chair, I, I, I'd like to hold it to find out how many how many uh, establishments it will affect. Okay. Yes, and I would like to see if there's any data that indicates whether it's purchased on a Saturday or Sunday impacts public health outcomes. I mean, because I just haven't seen that. So that may exist. I wasn't a part of the work group, so. Okay. I'm gonna hold eight, uh, Senate House Bill 974. Moving right along, House Bill 977, Public Safety Behavioral Health Surcharges. Madam Attorney. This bill renames the Public Safety Surcharge in Prince George's County to be the Public Safety and Behavioral Health Surcharge. The bill prohibits the surcharge from being imposed on residential construction if a preliminary plan for the residential development was approved on or before July 1st, 2005. The bill also expands the authorized uses of the revenues collected from the surcharge to include one, the operation of behavioral health programs offered by the county and two, the construction or rehabilitation of behavioral health program facilities in the county. Okay. House Bill 977. What is your pleasure? Move favorable. Second. There a second? Second. It's been moving to properly second that uh, we we uh, accept House Bill 977. All in favor, please say use your sign. Aye. Any Aye. opposition? Okay, we're going to move uh, House Bill 977. Okay, House Bill 979, alcohol beverage BLX licenses. So this is the cross file for a Senate bill that we heard several weeks ago and the delegation had passed out of the delegation. It authorizes an establishment in Prince George's County located within a specified area on the campus of the University of Maryland College Park that is issued a class BLX license to offer entertainment when individuals under the age of 21 years are present if certain criteria are met. Um, Who favorable? Huh, I don't know. I have a question. So, so that yeah. means. I don't question. know, Rosa. I, I can explain it. I, can, I knew oh, I was going to get it. I, 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 I have a question, but go ahead. So, hold, 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 hold tight. Did we, get a, did, we get, did we get a second on the bill? 
Did anyone vote second on this bill? Second. Uh, for discussion. Purposes. Education for the alcohol beverages BLX licenses. Madam Chair, if I might, we passed this bill, the Senate version's bill, unanimously. The Senate passed unanimously, the EHE passed unanimously. This is just <laughs> identical version. Uh, it does not expand the access to alcohol. It expands the hours in which people who can't get alcohol can stay in an entertainment venue. So it is, does not expand access to alcohol at all. And it was the, the, the plan was worked out after extensive negotiations between the City of College Park and the University of Maryland uh, and license holder uh, because of everyone's concern about it not having ill effects. So I appreciate folks' concern about protecting uh, folks uh, at this <laughs> point, but I share them. They're children. Is this a cross file bill? This is a cross yes, file yes, bill. Yes, yes, yes. Of a bill that you sponsored, uh, Senator, yes. right? Yes. You see, I'm, oh, okay. I'm just telling you. Okay. So we got a motion of, 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 of someone has voted favorable, Mr. Uh, Senator Beb. Did we, did we get a second on that? Second. Okay. So I, I have a question, Madam Senate. Chair. We accept House Bill 979. Madam Chair, I have a question, Senator Peters. Yes, Senator Peters. We had a similar bill with Senator Ramirez a while back on this issue. And the issue was he wanted to let people underage into certain establishments. My question is, how are these people going to be monitored? How is this process going to work to ensure that these individuals will not then get in, slide in, and have a beverage, because that's why we killed Senator Ramirez's bill a couple of years ago. Yep, uh, happy to address that. Basically, um, the University of Maryland uh, Police, the University of Maryland Office of Student Conduct, um, the city government, the Liquor Board, and the Assembly have all worked out a plan specifically to monitor that issue, because that was my biggest concern, frankly. And so they, we, we extensively reviewed the actual um, monitoring uh, technology that they're using, how they're keeping track of it. Uh, and so they've worked out a plan that everybody's agreed to, number one. Number two is to make sure they're abiding by it. There are recording requirements that I believe are either twice a year or four times a year where the establishment has to come and make a presentation to the city university partnership, to the university and the city. Uh, and we get reports from the liquor board. It's, 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 it's the most regulated um, operation that we will ever have in Prince George's County. And it's because it took about six months of negotiations with the university and the city and everybody else to come to an agreement. So very detailed monitoring for exactly that reason. That was the issue that I raised when they, they originally proposed it. But we think we've worked it out in a way uh, that will work, but we're gonna monitor. Like access to. <laughs> is this, is, uh, let me ask the question. Is this only pertaining to one establishment? It's one establishment on the property of the University of Maryland, yes. Mm. Are there any other questions? Is it going to, you think it would set a precedent, Senator? That's my only concern. Because again, no. there was another club in 47 that wanted this pretty bad. And we didn't do it because we were worried it was going to set a precedent. Because they were competing with DC, as I recall. DC allowed this, and this uh, other club wanted it right across the line. So, I, I, again, I share your concerns, Peters, uh, as to the liquor board. That, the liquor board believed they had the authority to allow this, but they asked us to put in a bill so it was limited to only one jurisdiction, only one facility for exactly that reason. I remember the establishment that was on Annapolis Road, uh, 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 Senator. I do remember that. So, uh, what is the what is the pleasure of uh, of uh, of the of this committee of the senators relative to House Bill? Uh, motion on the floor to accept it uh, and we also have a second um, i think on this one we need to we need to do a vote um destiny you ready yes ma'am all right so senator augustine no senator griffith for the sake of consistency i'll vote aye Senator Jackson? You're Senator on Jackson? You're on mute. No. 
Senator Rosapeth? Aye. Senator Patterson? No. Senator Peters? No. Senator Pinsky? Following uh, Senator Griffith's lead, I will vote aye for the purpose of consistency. Mm -hmm. And Chair Benson? Uh, no. All right. Three, so it's three, three yes, um, five no's. Okay. Three in opposition, five in support, five in favor. Okay. House bill, we're going to skip House Bill 80, a uh, 980, and come back to it. Oh. Oh, we're going to come back to this bill. To Madam bill. Chair, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, at 4.30, uh, I have a hard stop. I have a committee. I've got a chair regarding Kerwin, so. A part of that too? Yeah, so is uh, uh, Senator Patterson. I have a 4.30 also that I need to. What and, and time frankly, is it now? 4.08. Okay, and, and frankly- 10 minutes chair. after four. Well, we have two more bills that, that we wanted to take a look at. Um, Madam Chair. Uh, yes. I had a four o'clock hard stop for the vaccine oversight work group and I, I stayed with it. But the, the big issue we have to take up is this ethics uh, zoning bill. And Okay, all right. So we, well, I'm not sure. House Bill 980, uh, Madam- uh, uh, Madam Chair, Attorney? Madam Chair, um, we've got about 20 minutes left and I know there are a couple of amendments floating around. I mean, another option is to knock out those other two bills give some of the stakeholders a chance to look at the amendments um, and come back uh, midweek or something else for an emergency meeting just for that bill. But you're the chair, whatever you think works best. Okay, what is this, what's the thought of the senators? What, what are your thoughts? Would, I agree, we should put it off. You want to finish Madam these last chair, two bills and come back to 980? My concern is we, we um, due to scheduling, didn't get to take the bill up last week. I know there are a lot of stakeholders and a lot of interest in the bill. I'd like to at least proceed with the conversation. We've heard from a lot of constituents. We've heard from our colleagues. Um, you know, to me, I don't know when we get together again or if this is going to be potentially impacted by the deadline we have approaching midweek here. So, okay. All right. I'd okay. say present your information because we've all should be familiar enough with the issues. We've heard enough about it and followed it all the way over from the house. And, you know, everybody kind of knows the issue. I'd say if there are amendments for consideration, we could vote those up and or down if people are comfortable. What, where are the amendments? I've placed, them in the, yeah, I've placed them in the bill packet and I just sent a link to everyone to um, access the, the full bill packet here. So if you check your chat. Destiny, does that include the one I sent? I've yes, sir. I just got that from your office. It's in there too. Thank you. My pleasure. Madam Chair, if we want to get the discussion started, even if it's not uh, finalized, uh, that's fine with me. Yeah. Okay, Ma Madam, uh, Madam uh, Attorney, could you talk to us uh, about the bill? I I'm, I'm mostly interested in uh, the amendments to the bill. The amendments to the bill. So I have um, Senator Patterson's amendments to the bill that should be in your bill packet. So his amendments prohibit a Prince George's County Council members treasurer or continuing political action, political action committee or slate to which the member belongs from accepting payment from an applicant or the agents of the applicant while the bill is in effect. Are there other amendments to this bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I have one. Okay. Which I can explain or the council can try explaining. Um, if, if you have an idea as to what it does, I've only had a couple seconds to look at it. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, and this gets to the heart of the bill. Uh, look, I support the intent of the bill 100%. Uh, I think having a comprehensive rewrite makes total sense. And I appreciate the work of the council for the steps they've taken and bringing this to completion. I've asked a lot of questions about this in the last week and I've learned more about zoning than I want to know. Um, <laughs> but, I, and in fact, the bill actually talks about the intent of the council is to, a, to do a general comprehensive rewrite. The intent is to do a general comprehensive rewrite. 
my concern is it still leaves open some possible opportunities, whether uh, unconscious or nefarious, for smaller project uh, deviations, uh, amendments, whatever you would say. I don't think it is the intent for the council to do um, uh, specific property, specific property uh, project uh, efforts. But to make sure we close that door and make it explicit, I've offered an amendment that instead of just relying on the intent of the council, it says um, in adopting and approving a countywide zoning map amendment, which is what's before us, except upon the demonstration of error, the planning board and the district council, which is a county council sitting as a zoning board, may not consider any request made on behalf of any person for the assignment of a zoning category classification or approve any application for property that differs substantially from the applicable zoning category classification, including to intensify the zoning recommended in the document title proposed guide to new zones as adopted by the council. The, the council passed a resolution setting guidelines for this comprehensive effort. So I, I don't think the intent is to play games and I respect and appreciate all the hours the council put in. I just wanna make it explicitly clear that we don't wanna allow a developer or builder to try to push for a smaller property or project and still be able to contribute money to the council. That's all. If that's not the purpose, let's state it. Now again, this might Chair, I'd like to speak to my amendment, please. Uh, uh, my amendment simply says that you will be, uh, you must cease and dissent immediately in terms of continue um, taking contributions. Uh, there are a lot of major projects hanging out there that uh, cause me some concern as to whether or not those projects might be void if we don't act. Uh, uh, decisively today. Um, and um, I've, I've, I've gotten at least 300 calls on this bill. Uh, and, and and I know is either way I vote here, I'm going to get some feedback uh, in, in my respective district. So uh, I guess I'm trying to, to sort of compromise here and say, yes, we recognize the importance of the bill, of the projects out there but you cannot continue taking uh, contributions. To me, that would uh, void the whole intent of, of the bill that's before us. So I, I would like to offer that amendment uh, at the appropriate time. <laughs> okay. Uh, do, we have, do we have anyone here uh, on it, uh, um, uh, Madam um, Attorney? Do we have anyone here? You know, I'm not so sure that people understand the process that's involved in projects that occur in Prince George's County. I, I think people think that the, the, that the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning does not play, play a key role in this whole developmental process. Because before a shovel is put in the dirt, it has to go to Maryland National Capital Park and Planning and not to the council. Am I correct on that, uh, Senator Patterson? You got the chair, former chair, but I think you're correct. Isn't that correct, uh, Mr. Turner? Uh, thank you, and I, I know we have all to go to, have... It had to go down to zoning and... Okay, I, I, want, I, I didn't know that uh, the councilman was on. Ms. Uh, councilman Turner, could you speak to that? Yes, and we, we also do have Mr. Agent Gardner, who's general counsel for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission as well, to speak on behalf of the Planning Commission. Um, let me try to raise some points. So yes, if, if there is a development, take, taking this outside of the context of this legislation, which is separate and apart from individual or piecemeal applications. And, and the I mean, thing that also I want to be sure that everybody understands is that our my, my grave concern is the mapping. The Prince George's County, this, this whole issue has not been addressed since 1960. That's shameful for Prince George's County. That's shameful. And I do know that for seven years, and I've talked to a former councilman, how hard 
you all have been working on this for seven years and how much money it's cost the taxpayers. I don't think they recognize that. And the number of hearings, I looked at, at, the, at the list, it's almost 400 hearings that's taken place in the last seven years. And so that concerns me gravely. I'm sorry, but I just have to say that. Go ahead. No, thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. It, it has been an effort uh, between the county executive, the county council, and the Maryland National Capital Partner Planning Commission since 2014. We've tried this We tried to do this rezoning twice before and have failed. And this is the farthest that we've gotten. So I do appreciate uh, the senator's uh, consideration of the bill. Uh, and I know I've had some discussions with some of the senators about uh, potential amendments. And so, uh, if we could take the opportunity to review those uh, in more detail, we we can respond. Uh, we did accept an, app, uh, an amendment, obviously, on the House side that we thought was correct with respect to putting in a sunset of this process. Uh, but getting back to your original question, obviously, uh, development applications normally would go through the Park and Planning Commission before they come to the District Council. Uh, in this case, this is not individual applications that are coming before uh, Park and Planning Commission or the uh, County Council sitting as a District Council. This is a government initiated process to complete our zoning rewrite. Uh, have, as, as uh, Senator Pinsky indicated, we did adopt legislation in 2018, uh, CB 14 of 2018, that established the process for us to do this countywide map amendment. We initiated that countywide map amendment process and set guidelines for that in CR 27 of 2019. And that will guide us and the Park and Planning Commission moving forward if we're able to proceed uh, with the legislation that's before you. So, uh, I mean, that's our goal. We're not trying to backdoor anything. I know you've heard from various constituents. And to me, to be honest with you, it comes down to two words, trust and respect. You know, whether or not, uh, you know, our state legislature trusts us as the local elected officials to be able to move forward with this process, whether the residents of the county trust us to do this process. And we've gone through this process for six years now. Um, and have had outstanding participation. You see in your backup, the letters of support uh, from various organizations uh, that represent Prince George's County because of the importance of this process moving forward. And so we're here to, here to work. We just wanna make sure it's workable uh, with, with the amendments that are coming forward because what we found was the current law is not workable in the way that we uh, anticipated it uh, when we started this process and initiated the countywide map amendment. So. Um, obviously, you know, one of our other concerns, and, and you know this as well, we are on the clock with respect to, you know, any amendments and then having to go back over to the House uh, in order to get their concurrence. So I think that's uh, why we as, as, a, as a county, the county executive, the county council, and the Park and Planning Commission have all come together to make this request of our delegations and the entire General Assembly, because we understand the importance of moving forward with our zoning rewrite. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Mr. Gardner is here if you had a particular question about kind of the review process. Well, let's get his point of view and then we will move on. Well, uh, uh, good afternoon, um, members of the delegation. For the record, it's Adrian Gardner, General Counsel for the Maryland Park and Planning Commission. And I think one of the most important things is it sounds like everyone sort of got this great consensus that this bill needs to move and it needs to move forward. And that's why the Park and Planning Commission supported the bill because we do think that Prince George's County deserves a 21st century uh, zoning ordinance and a new zoning map. Um, I guess the point that I would, um, just to follow on what um, uh, Council Member Turner said, um, because the process has taken as long as it has and there has been so much community involvement, the next step in the process is to take the guidance that's already been provided and actually reflect that in a new map. And to do that on a sort of a wholesale basis, not a not a not a retail basis. And so, um, we have not had a chance to vet the amendments either, and would would you know uh, work continue working with the uh, council and the executive to do that, and um, we'll go from there. Uh, but we do uh, we do really appreciate the fact that everyone is we it seems to be a good consensus that we need to move forward. Let me just say I can appreciate the comments from Mr. Garner and Mr. Turner, but. You know, we got to realize what got us to this position uh, that we need this legislation in the first place. So I'll leave you there. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. This yes, is Jim, Senator. Jim Rose, but well, two things. One is I, I have two amendments that are being drafted, which I don't think the council has. 
Um, so we'll share them with everybody once, once we got them. Um, secondly, I agree, we gotta do something. There obviously was a technical fix in what the, the way the council went ahead on this. And so we need to, we need to do, a, a, do a technical fix. Uh, I wanna ask a question, which I'm glad um, folks are here to address. It's one of the big issues that I've heard expressed is that there've been whole lots of, um, I don't know what you call them, a day, affidavits or something filed uh, with uh, representative developers saying that they intend to come in or they may or they may or they intend to come in with zoning changes as part of this process. And I got one in front of me uh, from a lawyer. We he, all got it. Yeah, but I'm mean, saying hey, it, lists, it lists five, pro there's just one letter uh, from February 21st. It lists five properties and it, it says these affidavits are being submitted as the owner may determine to request a zoning intensification. And that implies that the lawyer representing these folks believes that this process uh, allows them to come in to get up zoning as part of what we thought was just a technical renaming of categories. Help me understand why that shouldn't be of concern to people. So thank you for that question, Mr. Uh, Senator Rosenpep. So under the current state law, which with this body, some of you approved, um, you have to file an affidavit whether or not uh, you gave a contribution or have not given a contribution if you expect to participate in this process. It's no different for an individual project and now we're doing it as the countywide map amendment. So to respond to your question, so as of the end of February, we received over 1200 affidavits. Right. Required, and that means not all of them had contributions. It just means people may come before the planning commission and the district council as part of this public process. And we cannot, under both state and county law, as well as case law, exclude any property owner from coming forward and making a request in public. And so we understand that. So there may be anybody could come forward of the 300,000 plus uh, properties in Prince George's County that may have an interest in doing something different than what is recommended under the matrix that was adopted under this previous legislation. We can't preclude that as, as a, a public body. And I don't think you want it to preclude that because these are residents of Prince George's County who want to address their government. The issue then becomes, and in this case, and I'll respond to Senator Patterson's question, of those 1,200, there were less than 20 that implicated members of the council that we could not go forward. And those are not from developers. I hate to say it. They're from individuals and some entities. Some of them are public entities, institutions in Prince George's County who filed the affidavit because they may come before us. And we have no idea as the, the planning board or the district council who and if they were gonna come. So they had to file that. So that, that's in one response. We can't preclude somebody from coming forward. I want a different zone. What we're going to utilize, and, and Mr. Gardner will confirm this, we're going to utilize the matrix that we adopted to say, your property is currently zoned this, it's more likely to go into this zone into the future. So that, that's what's going to guide us uh, going forward. We've always understood that uh, during this process, and that's what we're going to continue to do as the council if you allow us to move forward with the county map. Over what period of time is that going to happen? Assuming we pass this bill, assuming you go ahead, when are you going to get this done? So, well, we were prepared to do this last year, and obviously COVID hit us back in March when we had our scheduled hearing. We rescheduled the virtual hearing after we got a th authorization from the Attorney General that we could do it virtually. Uh, that was scheduled for the end of November. I'm just asking, how long is it going to take you? So it, we always anticipated it was going to take us a year to be able to do this. And so with the sunset on it now, obviously that we know the finite period of time is December of 2022. I we see. Can't, okay. I, I, we I can't see start that. the process until July 1st. And, and during that period of time, will developers and their agents be able to make contributions to members of the council dealing with these cases or not? So here, here I mean, here's the thing. From, from my perspective, it makes no sense for anybody. And, and listen, state law doesn't define who a developer is. All the state law says, who's the who's an applicant? Could be an individual property owner. Yeah, we're talking about an applicant, we're talking about an applicant, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I guess somebody could contribute. I'm, uh, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you. They can contribute now, but what the consequence of you contributing is that you're knocked out of, of, the, of the process. And that's a three year look back. So if you're going to contribute now during the next year and 
this is only the rezoning, you still have to submit a development application at some time in the future, that council member is not going to be able to participate in that process because they received the contribution during the three years before that application was filed. So I don't, it's conceivable, but I think any person who may have an application coming before the planning board or the district council in the future is going to make a contribution because that individual council member is no longer going to be able to participate as they currently are now in an individual or piecemeal application if it was to come before. So, so that prohibition continues the existing law? Correct. Correct. We don't change that at all. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. You. Sure. All right. Okay. Are there any other questions? Did you all understand what the, uh, what the- uh, Madam Chair, can I propose a solution that, um, you know, I know it's, it's late in the, in the session, but I think we need to get some of the key parties together and, and see can't we work this thing out immediately and uh, uh, get on with the business and maybe uh, uh, Mr. Turner uh, could work with some of us uh, here in the Senate to see if we can come up with a proposed some solution. I, uh, I well, I think the only thing that we can do is we have the bill before us and we have two amendments that we need to consider. And, and there are two more to come. Yeah, now S Senator Penske has indicated that you, you, the two of you have- Yes, one. We, we need to do this because a time is, is of essence. And I'm going to get back to the senators to set a time uh, before the end of this week. Great. We go where we where we respond to uh, Senate Bill 980. Um, Chair, thank thank you, Senator, say, and our and our team is willing to work, and we have this. <laughs> okay, and process. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, ask the vice chair of this of this uh, of the Senate to be the leader of the pack. Senator Patterson, you're the leader of the pack. Okay. Fantastic. I'm ready. Thank, to thank you so much, Councilman. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Attorney Adrian Gardner, one of my wonderful friends that I love so much. Yeah, he's he's done a wonderful job. Okay, now is thank that you for okay? inviting me. We're going to do that. That's, thank you very much. I want you to know I deeply mm -hmm. appreciate you. Okay, is that that good? Okay, um, we have two other bills. Can we act on them quickly, or do you have to wait? I have to go, Senator. I, I have. Uh, a <laughs> that we have to get done before executive noms and so does Senator Patterson. Okay. We can we can do this by yeah. Zoom, all right, Senator Penske? Yeah, we, we do have our House Bill yes. 1010 that's payment in lieu of tax agreement, low income housing. Okay. Uh, that's the Senator, uh, that's Councilwoman. County Executive. Also Brooks Bill. Can we act on that real quick? Second. Second. It's been moved to properly second that we uh, accept uh, House Bill 1010. All those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, yeah. moving on to 981, <laughs> tax sales limited auction. That's Delaware Baron. Did you all look at what it says, Madam, uh, Madam uh, Attorney? The bill limits the properties for which the tax collector in Prince George's County must conduct a tax sale by limited auction to abandon property consisting of either a vacant lot or improved property cited as vacant and unfit for habitation on a housing or building violation notice. The bill alters the requirements for who may participate in a limited auction by requiring that an individual work in the county if the individual is either employed by a federal agency or is in an honorably discharged veteran. Lastly, the bill establishes that if a pur purchaser at a limited auction was not an eligible participant, in addition to the certificate of sale for the property being void, any right or interest of the holder of the certificate of sale is void and any payment received by the collector at the sale must be forfeited and applied to any taxes and arrears on the property. Okay, what's your pleasure? What's your pleasure on House Bill 981? I, I don't know enough to make a motion. Up or down? I don't know enough to make a motion. Madam Chair, can we hold this till we reconvene so we can take a look at sure, this? Sure, sure. That'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And House Bill's good, uh, 1010 is good. And uh, uh, so you all know which bills are being held. Uh, we, we will get back to you for a meeting before the end of this month, of this week. <laughs> 
Patterson, you are you are you are in charge of 980. Uh, okay. Additional information to you all relative. Uh, if y'all could talk it over with uh, with the um, attorney, attorney, uh, and also with Destiny, so that we can come up with a consensus. We're going to come back and decide whether we're going to move these bills up or down. Is that okay with you all? Sound like a plan to me. <laughs> okay, Senator Patterson, all of you all, thank you so very much. I know that thank you. Right ahead. we got it done. And so I can sleep better tonight. I don't have heartburn tonight. <laughs> Jackson, do you have something you want to tell us? Senator Jackson? He must be talking to his wife. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Thank you, uh, Madam Attorney. Thank you so much, Destiny. Thank you all so very much. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting back together before the end of the week. Okay? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Right, Madam Chair. And thank, thank you, you very 